Welcome everyone to this Force Friday. Today, we're gonna to talk about the other side of art instead of discussing uh, skills and how to draw and how to see, how to think. Uh, we're gonna talk about the business side um, and just try to share with you as much um, experience as the three of us can muster uh, and hopefully answer as many of your questions as possible. Uh, so in order to get started here, uh, let's say hello to the gang. All right. How's it going, guys? How's it going, Ratunjay? It's going good. Might be the most interesting topic <laughs> today. Yeah. Yeah. I think to some artists, some artists really care about this and some artists could care less <laughs> about this. Right. You know, and that's fine. You know, that's fine. I've, I've met both. I have friends that are um, have successful careers and that those of which are very entrepreneurial and those that, you know, don't care about this at all. So um, how's it going, Swenley? Yeah, good. And in line with Betunja, I think this is very valuable, especially for newcomers, you know, people, artists who are trying to break into the field. It's uh, an important part, you know, the financial part and how to get a job, etc. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm kind of in a unique experience, hopefully, to help you guys out today in the audience. Um, Again, I don't know how much of my background you guys know, but I've had a very crazy career uh, from from being a freelance artist to being an employee, you know, to being an entrepreneur to also, you know, being the author and writing the books and then having to like manage, basically be a brand manager, uh, which is a job at a lot of corporations uh, and having to run all those different things. So when you do work in so many different ways in order to get paid, um, and you do it, you know, and I've been doing it over the 30 years, you get a sense of what you like and what you don't like and why. And, and there's pros and cons to each one of those um, avenues of how to make money, you know, as an artist. And for some people, like I said, this conversation doesn't matter at all. Some people are hobbyists and they don't want to make money at all. It has nothing to do with it. They don't want to turn it into a business. And I, I totally get that and respect that. Uh, and then there's a many of you out there. Um, in fact, many even on drawingforce.com that want to do fan art right just create fan art and post but then there's also a ton of artists on drawingforce.com that want to get full-time work or looking to switch a job or they're in the job they like but they want more skills so they can uh, make more money right so uh, so like i said we're going to cover all of that today and, and i have the good fortune of um having had the opportunity to almost cover every base that I could uh, financially speak. There's one or two that I haven't touched upon, things I'm actually working on, um, like licensing as an example, right? So there's, there's lots of different ways of trying to, uh, to make a living on your art. So that's what we're gonna get into today. Um, we're gonna be looking very intently as always at the chat, uh, really looking forward to hearing about your guys' questions. And you know we want this to be a very uh, back and forth conversation today. So you know, please feel free um, to type your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, and that's it. So let's get started, right? Let's head over to Photoshop. Um, the three of us have put these slides together. So um, we're just going to kind of open this as a group conversation. Uh, so the first one, I think one of the first really big ones is, you know, freelance versus a job. When I teach at the colleges, this is something I, I bring up to students sometime during a semester is to find out, you know, because most kids in school are looking to get work. You know, they're already paying for the tuition. So chances are, if you're in school, you're looking to get a job in the field. And I think it's, it's a question that a lot of students don't think about when they're in the middle of trying to get their degree is what, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to work freelance or do I want to get a job, you know? And they're very different. And I think each one um, each one can work or not work depending on who you are as well, right? So we thought this would be a worthy conversation to have to start off with, right? So let's start with freelancing. Um, so working as a freelancer, what are some of the pros, right? Uh, so the obvious one and probably my favorite one <laughs> is that you could set your own hours. Obviously the three of us are all like freelancers in a sense, right? Uh, we all get to get up, make up our own schedules. Mutunje and Swenley are both mentors at the site. And, you know, I don't tell them like, you got to work at this time and get up at this hour and work from nine to five. Like they set up their schedule. It's between them and the people that they teach as to 
what their schedule looks like, right? And the same with me. You know, I usually do start all of my mentoring at nine o'clock. So it's a little like I've made it a full-time job, but my schedule is pretty weird in that I work in the morning. I have afternoons off for a couple hours and I work at nights because I teach people usually on the other side of the globe, like uh, Australia or uh, like South Korea, right? I have students in both those, those countries. So, and I like that. I actually like that my schedule is a little weird because in the middle of the day, if I want to go work out or I want to go outside and it's not that crowded out, right? Because it's in the middle of the week, I have the opportunity to do that. I, I hated when I was full-time having to rely on getting things done only on the weekends when everybody else was off too, right? And everything is just like super crowded and busy. That was one thing that was really frustrating to me. Uh, earnings, sky's the limit. That's another huge one, right? Huge. Now for some people, that's pretty scary, which I can understand, you know, when you go to get a job, you know, you might do a little bit of back and forth on salary, but at least, you know, you're going to get paid it. Right. And we're going to talk about that as a pro for um, being an employee. Uh, but when you're freelance, you know, it's like being a sales rep or something, right. It's, it's on you. You, you know, you might make $30,000 a year or $300,000 in a year. Right. Really depends. Yeah. Really depends a lot on you. Mindset, work pressure is free, right? So that you're not as much stress, I guess, on the job, right? Murtem Jay, you put this together. What were you, you want to talk a little bit about that one and what you're thinking? Uh, about the mindset? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like related to the time management, you know, like setting your own working hours. You know, I can like spend my time with family and then I can like go out, you know. So as like you're also like moving out, so... You know, if you're like full-time job, then you have like, oh no, boss, can I have like, <laughs> you know, like a holiday, holiday or so something, and you know, he will like cut your salary. <laughs> I don't know like how it works across like with you guys, but in India right. especially, this happens. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that kind of mindset, you have a pressure that you are relying on someone. While working freelance, you can just take some days off. You know, if you have some important work and. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna hold it up for some days and yeah, just like do my work and get back again. So it's just like a so like pressure free, you know. <laughs> right now as I'm working with you guys, I don't even feel like that I'm working. You know, it's like I'm not saying it's easy, like it's very hectic and like I love doing it, but it's not that kind of nine to five job pressure kind of thing, you know. So Yeah. That's true. I mean it's less restriction, right? Totally less restriction. It's again, it's schedule and how much you have control over it, right? Yep. Okay. Let's head back here. Uh, direct dealings with the clients, right? So that's kind of interesting because when you're at the job, to Mertunje's point here, you're not usually dealing directly with the person who's buying the product, right? You're someone at a desk at a company, at a bigger company surrounded by other employees that's making something um, that somebody's buying, but you're not usually in direct contact. Uh, working with different clients. I would even say uh, choice of clients, right? Who you wanna work with or not work with, uh, and that you can decide. You can just say, you know what, I don't wanna work with this person. Uh, and that's fine, right? And then uh, work at ease from home, right? Most definitely. So a lot of great pros. Um, Let's see how the chat is doing before we move to another slide. I'm, wor I'm a working artist. I just want to improve my skills and have more life. Yeah, my paintings. I'm in college. I want to go into biz dev. Uh, hope to get some advice what I can do in that regard. Tried Redbubbles, but did not really kick off. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, Red Bubbles. Red, oh, Red Bubbly. Red Bubbly. I don't know what that is. Um, I think both would be fine. Both have pros and cons. Part-time is really important to me as I like to have time for my own projects. Yes, definitely. Separating work and home is important. With freelancing, it's easy to become a workaholic. Yeah, that is true, Brianna. That's definitely where I, that's where I fall in. <laughs> it's easy to become a workaholic, right? When you're a freelance, because you can just work 24 seven if you have the physical ability to do so. No job security is the worst fear. Yeah, that's a great point. So Aria um, makes this point about job security is the worst fear. I think it is actually probably at the top of the chart for humankind in general, not everybody, but in general, uh, is, oh my God, I need to survive. What's going to happen to me if I can't pay my bills? I'm going to be living on the street, right? Like I'm going to be living, <clears throat> I'm going to be living under a bridge, you know, somewhere. 
you know, I can all say that, um, you know, that's definitely my, my biggest fear, of course, um, having a family was always me picturing myself out on the street somewhere with my kids holding my hands and my wife the other hand and us having like really, you know, scroungy clothes and living in a tent on, next to a curb under a bridge somewhere. Like that was always my horror, which is honestly absurd because I, I have a network. I have a system. I have friends. I have family that if anything ever got that bad, I know I can rely on. So, but I have to say it motivated me a lot. And I think I've said this um, way back in these um, live sessions that I think in school, it motivated me too. you know, fear. I just kept, I was really worried about graduating school and not getting a job. And I, I can live with my parents. It wasn't a problem. Right. But I had this, I don't know. I had this thing about like, I have to get a job. I have to get a job, you know? So uh, I don't think fear is the best motivator in the world from a health standpoint, but it damn works. That's for sure. You know? It definitely works. It's, you know, it's, it, I can understand it being, I've been there. It can be scary to think, you know, where's the next paycheck going to come from? When I was in New York, I was freelancing a lot um, in advertising as a, I was doing all kinds of jobs from directing the storyboard art, artist and uh, character, background design, like everything you can think of. Uh, and I remember there being a very specific time of a couple of months where my wife and I were eating like, you know, rice and like pasta and potatoes, <laughs> you know, like that's all we could afford just to make sure we had carbs in us and maybe a little protein, you know, protein costs more, right? So mostly carbs just to get past the bills. You know, did I have a, a system? I could have ended up my parents' house or my in-laws' house. We could have done that. We didn't want to do that, you know? So we were kind of stuck in this place doing the best we can. And I can fortunately say it never had been like that since then, really, so... Um, the, the, the funny thing is, like, of course, uh, I've been there, the, the uh, fear of job security. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you think about it, at the company, it's kind of like a it's, it's difference, kind of like psychological for the most part, because you can get laid off or the company can go bankrupt, you know. So it's yes. not that much difference if you think about it. You know, what's, what's really yeah. secure? I agree with you. That's one of the big epiphanies for me is an all of my careers, I think I've been sort of formally laid off once, uh, which kind of like shocked me, you know, to the core. And I, that's when I really, I was like, wow, actually when I'm on my own, I'm safer because I know what's going on. <laughs> you know, when you're at an organization, you don't know what's going on. There's people above you that are making decisions and sometimes they're not making good decisions. You know, they're making bad decisions and they affect you know, your life for me, it was affecting my life profoundly. Right. Cause again, I'm trying to take care of my family. And, uh, that, that was pretty terrifying. That was a pretty scary situation for me. And I, I find, I, I kind of, it, it took me about a week and then I eased out of it and I was like, okay, I just got to go through the, you know, the, the rigmarole of going into LinkedIn. Let me start contacting friends and and strangers and just see what's out there. And then I saw that interviews were coming up and I was like, okay, something, you know, something will come out of this. Um, but it was nerve wracking for that first week. It's kind of weird, you know, especially when you're laid off, it really feels, I know for me, it felt like, what did I do wrong? Right. That's the first question, which I didn't do anything wrong. Actually, it had nothing to do with me. Um, and oh my God, you know, am I ever going to work again? <laughs> right. We're going to be out on the street in our, our wrecked clothes with the tent on the side, you know? Um, and I have students who, by the way, have been homeless. I have friends that are artists that have been homeless and now like are huge and like world renowned and have turned their lives around, you know? So it's not like homelessness is the worst thing in the world. But for me, that, again, that was the fear. Um, okay. So that, yeah, thank you, Swanley. That was a great, uh, that's an excellent point. Okay. So let's see, what do we got next? Um, so being the master of your own time, huge one, as we just said. I think my biggest frustration with being an employee is getting in the car, you know, getting in the shower every morning, same time, getting in the car, commuting, which pandemic has now kind of changed, right? Hopefully less of you are having to commute because more companies recognize that you can work from home, right? Um, but the commute, man, was always a killer. Anywhere from half an hour to, I've done over an hour, 10, 15 minutes sometimes for some, for one job in particular, and uh, not fun, right? Not fun when you're sitting in the car for two plus hours a day just to get to the job, right? Now my commute is walk out of the bedroom into my living room and sit down at this chair that I'm sitting at right now to talk to you guys, right? It's a much better, much, much better commute. Now on the flip note, 
you get to be the master of your own time management here. If I put this in a job uh, description, this would typically be the producer at a job. So you have to be able to do this. Right? We've talked about time management in the past. And you know, I've told you guys that Google uh, Calendar is my friend. Uh, I wouldn't be able to run my life without it, quite frankly, because I'm producing, I'm playing producer to my own life. So some artists are not good at that. You know, it's just not in the frontal cortex here of executive functioning to have the capacity to really design your time, which means maybe freelance isn't good for you. You know, it might be something to really track because you're a business, right? And if you can't stay on schedule and you're late trying to get artwork to clients, that doesn't go over well at all, you know? Uh, again, you guys jump in whenever you like, or if something comes up in the chat, please. Um, earnings, right? You can set your own rates. Again, some artists love this. Some artists hate this, right? Some of you have the sort of entrepreneurial edge in yourself and to, you know, like seeing how much can I make and that that's a goal. The finance is a goal. And again, some artists don't care at all, you know? Let's see, Tracy. Oh my God, I can you four hours a day to go to work. But now we work from home. Well, that's good. Hallelujah, <laughs> Tracy. Four hours is terrible. Yes, I felt like Conan the Barbarian on the Wheel of Pain when I had a full-time job every day going, yeah, I know. I, you know, I think the longest I've ever had for one full-time job is about four and a half years. And that for me was very long. Usually it's like two years and I start to really get an itch to get out, you know. But uh, yeah, about four, four and a half years was the longest I've ever been in a place. Um, okay, so earnings, earnings is a big deal. Earning your own rates, some people hate that, right? It's like, I don't want to decide it, you know, it's like haggling, you know? I, I actually like haggling <laughs> for things. So um, some people can't stand that and I get it. It's a little extroverted, right? To be able to do that. And most artists are introverted. So that's typically a tough thing to deal with. But you know, you can set that all up, set up your own rules and so on to make that as clear as possible. Work stress-free, right? According to your will or not. Uh, we talked about workaholic. You could be a workaholic and just cause a lot of your own stress. That's what I always fight with, <laughs> making sure I don't get myself into working, you know, 18 hours a day. Uh, here's uh, yeah. maybe like one point I can share is like you might be workaholic, but I've seen like if you if you give like too much to client, they're not gonna value your work sometimes. So you know because they just only want okay, you know they just only want you to work. They they really don't care about your health sometimes, and they really don't care if you're getting a fair amount or something. And you're just like giving you your mean all. an employer. Yep. Yep. So yeah. let's say if you're in a company you're working right now is at home uh, as a pandemic or something. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, they just um, <laughs> want all your work, but don't pay you. I, I feel that yeah. I feel this way. I've, I've like spent like countless night in the studio that I was working before, but I was not getting paid, you know? And the only reason they, they gave me is like, yeah, your work isn't accepted or something like that, but you know, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So sometimes, mm -hmm. You can be workaholic, but spend it on your own work, you know? Don't just like give 100%, I would say, like to such clients. So, yeah. yeah, I think the, the simple answer to this that I keep coming back to is it's fine to work as long as you're happy. You know, I, I know I have, somehow I have this internal barometer inside of me that says, this is too much, I'm starting to get frustrated or resentful about my work or my effort and I need to I need to bring the hours down and I, I've had that happen a few times in my life where I'm just getting I'm hitting burnout you know I can feel myself hitting burnout and I get frustrated by it um, otherwise you know if you're having a good time and you're working and you like working 15 18 hour days but you're enjoying it then go do it I, I would just advise make sure you get some exercise in there you know just to stay healthy and eat well but other than that, like go work, you know, if you like doing it, go do it, you know? Yeah, it's, always just, it's, I, I, it's a good problem to have, right? I mean, if you're doing, like yeah. you say, if it's something you're passionate about, then it's fine. You just have to like keep it balanced. You know, like for myself, the challenge is always like once I get drawing, it's I had to force myself to stop, you know, because I love it so much. So, you know, that caused me to like go to bed late and then get up late, <laughs> you know, so uh, and I see that as a good problem, you know, it, I prefer doing that than uh, 
doing something that I hate my whole life just because I need the money, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, there's this thing about, I guess, work-life balance. And I I think the answer is everybody's different in what that is, that sort of work-life balance. Some people, they can have a majority of their time be work and it's fine and they don't need a lot of downtime. And then there's others that need a lot of downtime and have a little bit of work time, just enough, you know, it's typically because they don't like what you're, you know, you don't like what you're doing. You know, if you like what you're doing, it almost isn't work. In fact, at one of my last jobs, um, when I was starting to feel a little bored, I started trying to reframe my job into thinking, I'm not going to work, I'm going to school. So I would, you know, I would obviously help the people that I was helping and I was managing, but I looked for any opportunity I could for me to learn. So I would keep bringing stuff up with my manager. It's like, hey, I want to really learn more on this side and this side. So I, I tried to make believe that I was getting paid to go to school, <laughs> basically. And that, that man, that changed my experience of going to work and let me push and stay in the job further than maybe I would normally do. You know, So how you think about your job, I think, uh, gravely affects it as well, you know. Uh, developing this internal barometer is difficult for some people. Yeah, exactly. Some need to get burnt to learn how to listen to this barometer. Yeah, no, totally. Would you recommend working for a company when you begin and transitioning to freelance later? That is a great question. So An12 Cub says, you know, what? where is it better to start? Um, I started definitely as employee first, but very quickly after that went to freelance, you know. Let's keep going through this, and I think that you know there'll be more information here that'll that'll more deeply answer. I think that question. Um, okay, let's head back to Photoshop. Some good conversation. So having transparency, as we said before, dealing with the clients is awesome. Um, the other side is working at a studio, right? So now you're an employee, right? Now the first piece of advice I would give to all of you is if you work at a job as an employee is make a believe make believe you're not an employee <laughs> make believe you're a freelance artist because it's so easy to i don't know get so acclimated to it feeling like home and that it's easy to, i think it's easy to get sloppy and not doing your job as well as you should be doing i liked always thinking sure i'm working here they're paying my check but I'm still like a little business within this place that I'm doing my job. I'm still giving a service. I was typically a, an art director or I was concept art uh, director to, at my last job. And I still tried to remind myself, like, you know, from the outside, people are look, looking at me as a service, right, in this organization and that I'm doing a good job with my service. And for me, thinking I'm like freelancer on my own business kind of helped me always keep that frame in mind. I've had it where I don't think like that at all. And it's fine. It's good that it's comfortable. But at the same time, I think with that comfort, it's easy to get sloppier, you know, and I just wanted to make sure I was really doing a good job. So for me, it helped me. Um, let's see. Yeah, so lots of experience. You know, we were just talking about where to start. You know, I started at Disney Animation and what a great way to start, right? I was surrounded by amazing artists from all around the world. And I learned, you know, in a year and a half, two years at Disney was more than four years that I got in art school by far, you know, just like having amazing artists around you all the time that you can ask questions of it was a huge learning experience. So I think that's huge. And not only even just in the art, but conversation, right? Communication skills, all of that. Um, getting to understand working on a team. I was, that's what I was just saying, right? So working with other individuals and understanding the dynamics of that is a big deal. I have to say that just with not only my own life, but even in lots of friends' lives, one thing I've seen with the pandemic is a lot of people being trapped at home. I think there's a lot more people out there sort of suffering from social anxiety because now they've been allowed to be sheltered. And so this is a challenge, right? Like trying to get out there again, back on your feet, you know, working with teams, working with people face to face, working together as a group. My, my biggest thing I would add to this is I think the biggest benefit of working at a company is accomplishing something bigger than you could probably accomplish on your own. And that team dynamic helps you make things that you probably wouldn't by yourself or couldn't, you know, by yourself. So really, really big one. 
Uh, let's see. To me, it's also important to have a purpose. Teaching is great because you're helping people. You can see why what why you are doing what you're doing. When I was an engineer, I was, it was so abstract. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, teaching is like the job description, but to Daniel's point, I'm aware that really what I'm trying to do is help people accomplish their goals, right? Like a coach, I guess, you know, like that's really, how I guess I see it as just trying to help others, right? Uh, Richard, hey, Richard, how you doing? I'm glad you made it today. Uh, what if work, what worked for me is that getting into a company allowed me to build a professional portfolio. Also, more people got to know me better, which can help you to get freelance, yes. So Richard brings up a great point. Richard's a professional animator. Um, and uh, yeah, to his point, right? If you're out there and you are, you know, you're working, um, you make a lot of connections, right? Huge connections you're in, like you're in the industry, you're at a particular company and everybody knows everybody else. All of a sudden the world gets very small. Um, and then when you're out and you want to freelance to Richard's point, you know, you've got a portfolio. It's like, oh, I worked at Disney. I worked at Sony, whoever, right? So yeah, that's an excellent point, Richard. Thank you. All right, um, let's keep moving. Already almost halfway through. You can rely on a paycheck, right? So this is what we were talking about before. Full time, not only the paycheck, but you know, I live in the U.S. and I run my own business right through the website, and I pay an exorbitant amount of money for health insurance, right? So. That still gets taken out of your check as an employee, but usually the company will chip in money towards the cost of your insurance, your health insurance, right? And that's actually a pretty big deal. Unfortunately, I think it's awful that it is a big deal, but it is a big deal. Um, so, you know, you get all these fringe benefits. I, I was at Zingo, it was one of my last jobs. And, you know, free breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day was amazing. <laughs> and like top notch food, amazing, right? The health insurance. Um, sometimes you get 401k plans and stuff like that, or you get stocks, right, in a company. So there's all kinds of like things around the peripheral of of the job. You know, here in the um, San Francisco area, there's a thing called uh, your golden handcuffs, right? Because you have shares, but you know those shares you can't sell them until you're X amount of years into the job. But it's so good that you're like, I want to leave my job, but I can't leave because when these shares vest, meaning that you can sell them. They might be worth $100,000 or 50 or a million dollars, right? So you don't leave. All of a sudden, you're like, damn, I'm stuck here, <laughs> right? I don't want to go. And that happens here in the Bay Area all the time, which for those of you that know the San Francisco area and wonder, like, why is it so expensive? That's one of the reasons because people here get what I call funny money. You know, you might be at a job for four years, your shares vest, and all of a sudden, you're a multimillionaire and you can go buy houses for crazy amounts of money, right? So that's like a cultural thing here, actually, in San Francisco. Uh, I wish that was the same in India. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's good and it's bad. You know, it's interesting. I mean, it's good. It, it empowers, I think, employees to have the ability to really change their lives financially. But it's bad in that you may stay in a job you really hate just because of that. You've trapped yourself in there, and it's not like you have to stay. You can leave. You just lose the opportunity to find out what's going to happen in those four years. And it's usually four years. It's usually a four-year run. Uh, um, you can learn from multiple. Should... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I wish I like we had like a better economy here because, you know, like talking about that paycheck thing. I don't know, like the people like sitting at the top notch shares, like uh, the postings, the better posting in the company, they don't even uh, like if you had like a crazy amount of money, you just want to earn like more money when I invest in somewhere. So what people does in India, they just like open an animation studio and they had like no relation to whatsoever with the animation or the art, never pick up a pencil in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, now imagine like how that guy's gonna treat you. You know, he's not gonna understand your mindset. He's gonna, not gonna understand the, uh, the client's mindset or in his own time. So <laughs> sometimes, yeah. you know, I, I wanna like reveal what I was like earning, I was earning about $200 like in my, like for a month. So basically 30 days of work, uh, they say eight hours, but you just have to stay up like nine to 10 hours per day. Uh, and $200 was, you know, not, um, it's just like a speck of money. So uh, right. they don't do your insurance. And uh, if you want to eat something, you have to like pay for yourself on a canteen or something like that. It's a pretty tough job, you know. So I just wish like we had a better economy. So, you know, something would be better. 
Yeah, you know, what happens in San Francisco is you have really big, extremely wealthy companies and mm -hmm. therefore they have to offer more benefits to the employee pool because they're competing against one another, right? Like we have Facebook here, we have Google here, we have Apple here, Tesla here, you know, it's like big, big, you know, tech companies, video game companies that are here. So they, the, the culture here is they know Oh, if you don't, go, you know, Facebook's not going to take care of you. You're going to go look at Google or Apple. And over there, it's like, oh, yeah, they have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, too. I, I've been to Google on the grounds because I have friends that work there. And, you know, you go into Google and it's like going into the food court at a mall. It's like you got Mexican, Italian, like you can pick whatever kind of food you want every day, <laughs> you know, and it's all right there for you. You know, it's just what comes with you being an employee, you know, and that's that's what that's what this culture has built here in, in San Francisco. And it's affected some places in the world to try to match that you know <clears throat> i think it's great i mean try to help when you go into these jobs you also kind of become i remember when i was started zynga you know you always also become aware like oh there's foods here they're trying to keep me longer <laughs> right they want me to love it here so much that i don't leave you know but that in the end that wasn't the case i mean i, I still had just a regular job i didn't end up staying till eight nine ten or eleven o'clock at night i would still leave if i wanted to eat dinner there i could eat dinner there if i wanted you know so yeah, it wasn't. It fortunately, it wasn't like that. Uh, okay. Let's see. So learning from any industry experts, we just talked about the cons. So you might have to deal with frustration. This, you know, Matunje was talking about this before. I'd say the biggest one is not having control over your own life and schedule. When I, in short, I went from working at Disney and then I was in video games for about a year, and then I was out on my own for. I don't know, about uh, 14 years or so, not being full-time anywhere. And then I got a job as an art director at a game studio, and it was really hard for me. Like, first of all, I think I got two weeks vacation, which is kind of normal in the U.S. In Europe, they usually start with like three or four weeks vacation at the right from the start in a job. Here in the U.S., more like one or two weeks. So that kind of blew my brain. I was just like, how... How am I going to do that? <laughs> I'm going to work and only have two weeks of vacation and then a few days, let's say, during the holidays for Christmas and all, you know? I hated that. I have to say, I, I really couldn't stand that. And I had, you know, I had my daughters who were still pretty young and I had to go to work every day. You know, I just, I really was, that was very frustrating. Um, you have to work on a time, right? Yep. Individual recognition is affected. Immediate decision making is impossible. Yeah. The other big thing to my manager's credit is I complained every day, I think to him for about a year until I finally calmed down out of my entrepreneurial mindset. Almost every day was like, I don't understand why we do this like this. If we just did this, this would be faster. This is like so efficient that we're doing this. Why don't we just go talk to blah, blah, blah. You know, and every day he would be like, look, this is how this thing works. You know, this, this has to go through this person, this person, and literally almost a year of me going through that for me to finally like calm down. Uh, so yeah, pretty challenging for me. It was very challenging. All right, so that kind of concludes the you know pros and cons of employee and freelance. Um, sometimes you can have you know what's well, not in there is a part time job. Daniel actually mentioned this before. Uh, you know maybe you go part time, right? So at least you have some income. Maybe you're doing just enough to get some health benefits and you have enough time to work on your own stuff, right? As artists, I think artists love that kind of space. Like you get a freelance gig. Um, you know, I've heard of lots of people trying to go to Starbucks for part-time or like Trader Joe's for part-time as a supermarket because uh, they have good benefits. You're not, it's not a, a job that is going to like creatively suck you dry, you know, um, because it's a easier more physical kind of job you know it's not it's not it's not a creative one it's basically i guess my point so i've heard lots of artists do that you know get some kind of you know just try to get some income i was teaching for a while where that was my part-time job so that was almost like me being an employee but it was you know maybe two days a week of teaching and then i had three days a week and a five-day week to go do what i wanted and i really enjoyed that i mean my years at sva were like that and, and then it just got too much I actually grew into more like a four or five day a week thing uh, which is how the books showed up again. Cause I was like, I've had it. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I'm burned out. So how do you find work? Right? So great. We're talking about, you know, going out there and becoming a freelancer or, uh, getting a job, but
but how do you find it in the first place? I think this is probably one of the bigger challenges for artists. Maybe you're an amazing artist, right? You got all this skill, but you know what? You're not making any money. You're not getting paid, right? And if you want to make a living through your art, right, you have to get paid. <clears throat> so I want to start this conversation with marketing and advertising. So I have this simple little circle here with this um, little orange one inside, this blue one with the orange one in it. Uh, the point of these circles is to say, you know, marketing is a bigger thing. Okay, marketing is you understanding your product, you figuring out like who your clients are, you know, what does that relationship look like? What's the brand that you're building? It's much larger. It's a much bigger, much bigger umbrella. And advertising is probably what all of you think it is. Advertising is actually saying, I'm going to put an ad out, right? But you can't put the ad out unless you know who you think wants to buy it, right? So I have some people I'm mentoring right now, these two sisters, and they're selling stickers, right? So how do you do that? You know, you got to figure out like, where am I going to sell this? What's the platform I'm selling it on? How much are the stickers going to cost? You know, what's the profit I want on the stickers? Who's going to buy this, right? So now I start thinking about advertising. Where am I going to invest my money, you know, in advertising? Do I have an advertising budget? Am I going to have to just do this all on social media and hope that, you know, things get some traction, right? It's a whole other job, right? Which is why if you go to a big company, a game company, an animation company, there's an entire team, right? For marketing, a huge team just for marketing, right? So if you're interested in being more entrepreneurial, more freelance, this is something you've got to pick up. You know, you've got to start figuring out the difference and what does it mean? How are you going to do it, right? And there's a lot of, I mean, there's, you know, there's marketing degrees, right? People go to college for four years to get marketing degrees. So it's a pretty big deal. You know, it's actually a pretty big deal. Do you need to go to school? No, I don't think so. I don't think you do to, to get good at marketing, but I want you to just be aware of it. And I want you to be aware that marketing is the bigger book and advertising is just a small part of it. Okay. I think it's worth mentioning to your point, Mike, that this is, these are our skills that you can learn. You know, like I myself, I've read a couple of good books about marketing. I even took a mini course. Uh, in the past, you know, so you don't have to become like, say, a marketing expert or have a degree, but you want to know the basics, you know, to have some understanding of what you're doing and, and how to do it effectively. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, it just reminded me when I was at Zynga, um, Zynga, depending on who the CEO is, I went through like three or four of them in the time I was there. Um, analytics was a big deal right to the marketing team they would use analytics and metrics you know measuring like responses you could do um i forget the term now for it when you bring it you know like testing and stuff you could bring people in you know you pay these companies tons of dollars to get people off the street to come in test on games right so you're trying to get information uh people are taking questionnaires you're getting all this data right it's lots and lots of data because you're hoping the money that you spend there is going to be an investment towards the bigger amount of money you're going to spend investing on, let's say, a game. You might say, you know what, we've got a $2 million budget for advertising on this game. So we have to do the marketing and the market research, right? That's why it's called market research to understand the market um, to say, how do we best use this money? Now, I was on the creative side. I'm not a, a you know, uh, an analyst. Uh, and I have to say, you know, I think it's really great. Uh, you know, we do surveys at drawingforce.com. At least once a year, I always try to reach out to our audience and find out what they're happy with, what they're not happy with. Because I think my job is to make sure everyone at drawingforce.com is happy. You know, you're happy with the service we're providing you, right? Um, so with the metric stuff, though, um, what you can't measure is creativity, though. You know, and I think that was always this like very uh, healthy debate at Zynga that we would have is the an analytics versus coming up with some crazy new idea at a left field that potentially has the opportunity to go viral, right? And maybe it doesn't cost that much money to put out there, you know, and some things, some things come out of left field, you know, and like I said, it was always this healthy friction of trying to take the data and come up with something fresh and new versus also just like, hey, we're the creatives, let's like come up with something that's going to be so intriguing because we know the game we're selling well enough, right? And we play the games to really understand that audience, right? So yeah, very interesting. Lots of interesting conversations uh, because of that. 
So that leads me into demographics, right? Some of you may have never heard of this term, demographics. You know, demographics is basically knowing your audience. Again, going back to Zynga, because that was my last full-time job. I think what we did that was really clever marketing would bring this up is to really create profiles. You'd say, you know, you'd pick like a male and a female, let's say, and say, uh, you know, hey, we're making this video game. Uh, Joe lives in Illinois. Uh, he's 32 years old. Um, he's got a part-time job, but he loves playing our mobile game. He usually plays our game at this and this time of day. He likes spending X amount of dollars on this game. Here's things he likes buying, things he doesn't like buying, and so on, right? So you literally would create like a whole profile of who you think your customer is. And that comes from a lot of the data and from us feeling like we know the game, right? So that was kind of interesting to me. I thought, wow, that's cool in a way, because coming from the entertainment industry, you know, you're creating a character, right? That's the demo. Now, I think the most powerful way, and this doesn't always work, depends on what you sell, but for you guys here, right, we're selling artwork. Um, I think it's best if you are the demo, you're the demographic, you know what your audience likes because it's you, right? You love your own stuff so much that you're like, I love these stickers, you know? It's like, okay, well, take a look at yourself. I'm this old. This is what I'm doing with my life. This is how much I'd be willing to spend on a sticker, right? If you're not an outlier and you're like, I'm someone who's willing to spend $700 on a sticker, <laughs> right? Then if you have the rationale of understanding like what people would pay and what normal folks would pay, then you probably have a pretty good sense of what the demographic or who the demographic is, you know? I say this all with a grain of salt and you want to be careful as to how, how well do you really understand yourself and this space, you know, who are you? But I think the cool idea is that I'm trying to share with you is be aware of who the demographic is and even write up like a little profile, a male and female profile and try to figure out you know, who comes to, like for me, who comes to my site? I know it goes all the way from teens that are trying to get into colleges, art schools, and we've done that. Um, in fact, not to go on a total tangent here, but I just posted a new uh, student uh, success story. Uh, so please check it out later on Nathaniel, who was trying to get to an art school up in Canada. Um, so we have, you know, students like that. We have students who are hobbyists, students that are college kids who didn't feel like they got enough out of art school. And now they're like, oh my God, I, I finished art school. I'm not good enough to get a job, right? Like help me out with that. So we help people get their portfolios together. Uh, people, like I said before, that are pros that want to push, the, you know, advance their careers. And I have people that are retired that are just doing it on the side. And they're like, I've always wanted to draw. You know, I was responsible adult, right? A responsible adult in taking care of my family. And uh, I've been doodling for 70 years and now I wanna like draw, right? I've, I've had that, I've had that too. So know your demographic, very important. Sometimes you can have the best product and you are missing the mark as to who the person is that would wanna buy it. And if those two things miss, right? You're not gonna be able to financially fund yourself, right? So very, very important. Uh, there yeah. are a couple of questions in the chat. Mike, can you uh, answer them? Yeah, let's see. What's an easy way to find a suitable client? I usually draw dark industrial apocalypse stuff, but I don't know where I'd find people who would buy. You know, I would say to pack, you know, sometimes you want to just start with finding the, um, finding your buddies in that space. Like who else does that? I have a friend that named Tom that lives on the East Coast who makes a lot of dark art, not sort of post-apocalyptic, but kind of like fun dark. You know, he'll do like Halloween-ish stuff and all. And uh, and I forget the name, but he's a part of something called like the Dark Society or something like that, right? And there's like this whole group on Facebook and all these artists that like doing more like vampire things or Halloween things, right? Magic things, right? Like dark arts, witchcraft, right? And it's like a whole genre. It's a whole space. I think you got to find your, you know, you find your peers. And when you find your peers, you'll also start finding the client clients. Sometimes the peers are the clients, right? In the art world, who do you think buys most of each other's art? Usually other artists, <laughs> right? I'm not, without, again, going into particular names, there's tons of guys on Instagram that are selling their drawings, right? They might do two or three sketches a day, put them out there for $40 or $100. Most of the people buying those are other artists, inspiring artists or professional artists, friends, Right. So we're also supporting our own community. So I would highly recommend like find your niche, you know, find the community and kind of start there and then work your way out. 
Um, Daniel, um, I get what you mean. It's important to feel valued. Sometimes money is not the only way, though. That's true. When you get feedback from people who have enjoyed what you've done, it's also really rewarding, most definitely. Uh, you also have to know the market, whether people are charging. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Exactly. Um, yeah, finding community is also great. I'm the only one who I know that draws like me. That might be true, Pac, but there's still a genre that you fit in. Believe me, no one is so unique that you're the only person on the planet that's doing this particular thing. Maybe your style is unique and that's great, but you fit into something, you know, and that's, I think, what you got to step out enough from on your own work and take a look at, you know. Very helpful new artists that haven't done footwork yet. Don't give up and get out there. The cream tends to rise to the top. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Don. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, what kind of work do I create and who wants it? <laughs> so this is kind of right in the conversation here with um, with Pac's question, you know. You know, you have to kind of step out of your own work and be able to look at it and say, what am I doing? It's like, it's like taking movies and putting them in genres. There's, hey, there's action adventure, there's sci-fi, there's fantasy, there's horror, there's documentary, right? There's rom-coms, right? There's all these different uh, genres. You gotta, you have to kind of figure out your genre, right? And then there's numerous tiers to this, of course. Like, well, what's the kind of stuff I like to draw and paint? Sometimes, this sounds really crazy, but sometimes your style and the context could either purposely mismatch and boom, that could be like the big prize or they mismatch and they don't work. Say for instance, you drew like cute little teddy bears, but you decide to make cute little teddy bears post-apocalyptic and it's like just blood and guts all over the place, right? And it's like, wow, this guy's crazy. Like look what this artist is doing. That might work. It also could totally fall on its face, right? It's like, no one's interested. Post-apocalyptic people don't care about teddy bears, right? So you got to be aware of that too, you know? The other thing I want to say here um, that we didn't have on our list today to talk about, one thing you want to watch out for, uh, and I know other artists on YouTube have talked about this as well, as well and I agree, is uh, you don't want to only get, I think, stuck in the place of creating art for your audience that you don't like to do. And it's very easy to slip right into that trap because you're watching your numbers, you're watching your subscribers, you're watching your income, right? And it's very, very easy to get stuck. You know, my joke always to my, to that, for me, that happened is, you know, at the beginning when I was freelancing in New York, the work I didn't like doing was still in my portfolio, typically at the back of my book. And of course, that would be always the jobs that people would be like, oh yeah, we love that you did that. Like, we want to hire you for that. Right? So I realized like, if I don't like something, I just have to get rid of it. I can't show it. I'm just going to forget it ever happened. Sure, I paid some bills, but I got to get this out of here. You know, don't put forth what you do not want to do. OK, because I can guarantee it. Murphy's law. That's what people are going to ask you for. So get it out of there. So this question, I'm just putting it together. It's the end of this segment of like, what kind of work do you create? Be aware of what you do. Find your home base. Find your peers. Through that, you will also find people that want to buy your work. And who wants it? You know, who is your demographic, as we said before? Right. Really important. Okay, this is the last lesson for me specifically I wanna share, which is, um, and this one took me a long time to really believe, but the idea is um, specificity equals ubiquity. And there's some big words in there. It's like, well, what does that mean? The more specific you can get, the more ubiquitous, which means the more it's actually normal, right? The more it's all abound, all other people, there'll be other people who recognize that, that work, right? which is why at the bottom of this, um, this slide, I have this, the globe, there's 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet Earth. Pac, for instance, was saying, I'm the only one who does my, my particular thing in my style. And that could be, but I can guarantee you out of 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet, there's at least a thousand that are gonna love your work, okay? Your job is to find them. All right, that's the job. The job is to find them. You, you do your thing and you got to figure out how to connect yourself to these folks that are out there that haven't seen your work yet and don't know like, oh my God, I love this guy's stuff. It's so unique. It's so different. It's kind of in this area, but look what he's doing specifically, right? And you got to, you know, like I said, that's the marketing and the advertising part of things, right? Just to find them. 
before the internet was even big, I used to, when I was teaching New York, my thing with students, I'd say is like, you know what? I guarantee there's tons of people out there that draw way better than I do. There's the next Michelangelo, but he might be sitting somewhere in a basement and the world will never know this person exists, right? So it's kind of a shame. I think if you're good at something, your job in a sense is to share it with the world, right? To, to, to better the world, right? To inspire other people, to inspire humanity, to be better as well. But there's, I'm sure right now, it could be one of you, for all I know, is like super amazing and you're hiding out in your bedroom or in your basement working all the time and none of us know how awesome your work is, right? And I think your job is to share that, <laughs> get that out there so we can see just how amazing you are and it inspires the rest of us. And then we all start, you know, bunny hopping off of each other and creating better and better work, right? So the specificity is ubiquity, right? It's okay to get really small in your unique thing because there's so many people on this planet, it doesn't matter how small you get, there's an audience and that, you know, you want to get down and then that opens up the funnel on the other side, basically. And I, I, I'm a great example of that. I drew, you know, I wrote a force book because I wanted to stop teaching quite honestly. And then look, you know, here we are 20 years later, right? And we're talking on YouTube and there's a website and we're teaching people around the world and I've traveled. That was not my intention. My intention was this is the end not the beginning, right? But by getting down to something so specific, it opened up on the other side, right? Was there something one of you guys wanted to say? I heard one of your mics gone. Uh, especially uh, with the internet, like the technology is evolving so much. Before, like when the internet was new, you just have like code and like to build a website. Right now, you can just like take any services and just create a website like in hours and just put all your work there and like put some advertising and yeah you know that was my mindset like before when i was in school it's like oh you do your work and like people are gonna find you but they're gonna find you <laughs> with the internet like you cannot just like uh, with the other artists it's uh with the old masters like it's kind of different you know there's no technology there's not, nothing like you can connect with the other side of the world but right now you have to uh i think you know you have to be with the time okay so basically just like use the facilities that being given out to us and it's very easy you don't have to like code or something like that just upload your work and show it to others you know and that's how i would say yeah and, uh, never never in the history of humankind has it mm -hmm. ever been easier for an artist to get their artwork out there and get it out to the public ever in the history of mankind right you guys have got it better than anybody ahead of you right now there's the competition out there, but there's always was competition. But now you have the whole world, right? To be able to advertise to, to, to share your work with, right? Like that's amazing. That is an amazing opportunity, you know, amazing. Uh, let's see, Valerie says, I do love that. Do what you do. The people who love it and want it are definitely out there and the real job is to find them. Yeah, <laughs> mind blown. Uh, love it, yeah. Uh, you can also create your own YouTube channel. Yeah, gain a following that way. It probably won't happen overnight. Yeah, the other thing to be aware with the internet is it doesn't typically happen overnight. It's a very big train now. It's a big machine. The wheels typically turn slowly unless you do something that's so radical that you get some kind of viral thing going on. But in general, it's a slow train. It's okay, you know, because slow trains are hard to stop, right? So you build up your audience, you build up your audience, and it, it takes time. You can't, you know, if you're going to do a, an online thing like we're doing here today, I think you got to give yourself five years, you know, like it's not six months, it's not a year. It's like, it's five years. Look at where you think you want to be in a five years time and really get a, get a realistic number attached to that. And then build up the schedule backwards from that every three months, check in where you are every six months, every year, and just got to keep moving. See, most people do not have the commitment to that if you said to most artists like yeah work on this five years like five years man that's a lifetime it's not a lifetime from someone who's a little over 50 believe me <laughs> five years is not a lifetime it's not that long okay when you're younger i get it it seems very long i've been there but it's really not you know all right let's see getting here towards the end <clears throat> Yeah, and the close on this specificity ubiquity thing where this actually started for me was when I was in school and I was taking comic book classes, I was trying to figure out what kind of stories I would write. And one of my students, teachers said, write something personal. And I'm like, nobody gives a crap about <laughs> my life. You know, like who cares about what's going on with me? And that lesson, like I said, I've learned a hundred times over now is that is what people care about. 
You know, people want to know it doesn't have to be specifically my life, but it could be something specific in my life that's happened to me. And I guarantee there's a million people that that same situation has happened to. And they'll be like, wow, this person really understands me. Like, how did they do that? It's just because I'm just paying attention to myself, right? When you do that, you have self-awareness, you reach other people because we all go through the same thing. Look, like I've traveled again, all around the world. I think the one thing that really surprised me at the start is I would go to Italy, you know, I'd go to Poland, go to Japan, these countries, and all the artists all over the world have the same challenges. I was always waiting in Italy to like run into the new Michelangelo in class, you know, and be like, oh God, somebody in here is going to kick my butt, <laughs> you know, in their drawing skill. And I'm going to have to say, you know what, you go teach this class, not me. I, and I still wait for that, quite honestly. And in Italy, I thought I'm going to find it here, right? It's Italy, right? It's like the home of force. Uh, and, you know, Italian students have the same challenges that anyone has in Germany or Poland, Germany, uh, you know, like I said, Japan. It's all the same thing. Everyone's going through the same thing. We're all the same. We're on the same space. We all grow up with parents. We all grow up as children, your grandparents, family units, financial problems, going to school. It's all the same stuff, right? That's the world. Our, the way our world works is what we all live in. So we're more common than you would, could imagine, even when you think you've got your own little thing going on. So common, okay? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Very passionate about that subject. <laughs> All right, getting paid, getting paid, man. What rate are you going to charge? Man, this is a tough one. So I'm gonna share just a quick story on this because we're almost at the end of time here. What I used to do when I started freelancing in New York, and this is a true story, is I remember in the first job or two, I'd come back from Disney. I started getting animation work in New York City. And they would say, hey, you know, what do you want? They wouldn't usually tell you, right? They want to find out from you what you want. Why? Because they're hoping you lowball yourself, <laughs> right? So I would, I forget what the rate was. I would say maybe like, oh, I'm, I'm thinking like 250 a day. I would, it's not like I came up out of the blue with it either. I did some research, right? I looked at books. At that time, I would go into like the illustrator's guide or something like that to get some numbers, okay? And what I hated and terrified me more than anything is when they said, okay, right? <laughs> I was like, oh no, they think it's okay, <laughs> right? Like this is, this is really bad because that means maybe it could have been more than what I was asking and I'm, I'm low bowling myself, right? Maybe the guy sitting next to me is making way more than this, right? So I would, over the few first few months of freelancing in New York, I used to just keep bumping up the price and bumping it up. And I literally got it up to anywhere between five or $700 a day. And this is in the early to mid nineties, right? And, uh, and finally I would start getting to a place where companies would say, oh, that's more than we were anticipating. You know, like, we don't know if we could do that. And I would just say, that's fine. Um, let's negotiate. I'm, I'm totally willing to negotiate because I want to work with you guys. That's where you want to be. I like to get the client to go, I don't know if I can do that. And then normally that's when you get the answer out of them. It's like, well, what were you looking to spend, right? But at the beginning, if, you know, I've been on the other side too, when you're buying services and you really hope that they're going to come in with something low, lower than what you were thinking you would have to pay, right? So that's how it works, right? And I think I was at that time, I think at least for storyboarding and working in advertising, I was probably one of the highest paid artists at that time in New York because I really pushed against the ceiling, you know, and I think it's better to do that and say you're willing to negotiate than to lowball yourself and then not even really know what the ceiling is. Now, you know, Swanley Mutunji and I talked about this earlier in the week. At the same time, you have to be able to back your skill, right? Like, you know, you have to, you have to be able to demand that kind of price because you're good at what you do. So the rate thing is really affected by where you live, right? It's different. It costs something different for Matunjay to live in India than it does Swenly and I, Swenly in Europe and me here in the US, especially in the Bay Area, right? It's like one of the most expensive places on the planet to live. So you got to be aware of what are you charging? You know, where do you live? What are the going rates? What's the going rates in this genre of work and art? Somebody said that earlier in the chat, right? You know, where, where are you at? So, you know, with your skills. So there's lots of different things in there, but to make it easy and get it down to you, I always say aim high and negotiate. Don't aim low. Okay. All yeah, right. And I would say you have to 
to come back to your point of negotiation, like you cannot approach it from a place of fear. You know, you have to be confident, like Don brought up in the chat. You have to be confident in your skills as an artist and don't uh, undervalue yourself. You know, like you will have people approaching you and you know, people always see an artwork and think, oh, that's something easy to can you can do just uh, in, a, in a couple of moments and uh, let's do it for $50, for example. You know, and you have to be, uh, you have to value your skills and your time to say, no, that's, uh, this is a job like any other job. And, you know, if you want like a professional plumber and to go come and fix something in your house, you're not going to pay them like uh, $5 an hour, you know, <laughs> that's not going to work. So why do you expect it with art? You know, it, if it was so easy, like do it yourself, then you don't need me as an artist. Right. No, totally. Okay, let's see. So in closing, okay, so in closing, we have getting paid, right? So it's one thing to get the money that you want. Now another is to actually get paid. And there, as Swenley put these together for us, um, you want to avoid the risk of doing the work and not getting paid, right? That's like the worst case situation. There's a couple, there, here's two ways that we came up with uh, that we've all done at one point or another in our careers. Number one is the, the simplest one is try to split the fee in half. Now, if you're freelancing, I, I would do freelance work in New York and advertising, and I got paid by the day and I would get a paycheck, you know, at the end of the week, even though I was a freelancer, right? But if you're really doing like a job and let's say the job's worth $3,000, right? You want to at least try to get paid 50% up front. And the least, you know, if they don't pay you at the end, you know, at least you walked away with half, right? Even better than that is to split it up in thirds. Because again, if you don't get paid at the end for whatever reason, at least you made two thirds of the job back. I have to say, for me, I learned this lesson through my wife's business because my wife used to run an interior design company and we did a lot of murals for children's rooms. And uh, we had learned on our skin over a couple of clients. In general, clients were great, but every so often someone would come in and they would rip us off at the end, right? So we learned we're going to do this in thirds. We had one guy that we knew was really difficult. We could tell almost ahead of time he would be tough and there was this chance he would back out. So we actually really front loaded like almost more than two thirds of the job at the front end and we got paid what we wanted to and then actually overcharged a little bit thinking he's going to leave. And he did, <laughs> right? So we actually got paid what we wanted to get paid and front loaded it. And we figured, all right, this last check, if he doesn't show up or he backs out, doesn't even really matter because we really got what we thought the job deserved right at the front. So, and this is all contractual. And it's not like you need a lawyer to do this stuff. You know, you can have simple contracts, just say, look, this is how I work. I like working in this certain kind of process. I want to get paid a third when we get past this checkpoint, another third when we get past this checkpoint, and then the last third at the end, right? I know it sounds maybe a little scary. Believe me, this doesn't have to be in legal talk or anything. It can be very simply written, and you sign it and just have your client sign it and say, this is how I work, this is how I want to get paid, right? It doesn't have to be a big deal. I had a quick addition to that, Mike, which I've also yeah. done in the past, because if you look at it from the client's point of view, they can also think, okay, I don't know you. It's the first time working with you. What if I yeah. give you 50% upfront and you disappear as an artist? You know. Right. So what I have done in the past, say, okay, uh, let's do 50% when I deliver the first ideas, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, And then it's safer for both sides, I think. Mm -hmm. Or like I, I, think, I think the third thing is even better because you know, their risk is a third up front. Your risk is really the third at the end, right? Mm. So you're, you're both putting risk, right? You're both in this together and shaking hands and understanding this risk, risk for both sides, you know? Yes. So my, if, if my suggestion to all of you out there, if you go freelance, I would try to push into thirds, you know? Now we haven't, by the way, before we um, continue and end today, I'm not getting into the nitty gritty here of like, what platform is best if you're creating product that you need to ship? You know, should you be on Etsy? Should you be on Shopify? Like, and that's a whole other thing. And there's a lot of research to do in that. We're just trying to give you an overview of how things work and how you can get your get yourself out there and hopefully inspire some one of you out there today to um, go and do your thing. You know, and be aware of the abstract of being an employee versus freelance and entrepreneur. 
and what all that means, right? All right, so here we are, we're almost at the end. Getting paid, right? Um, so yes, yeah, setting clear rules. How many revisions are included in the price? And charge a higher fee for any extra revisions, right? So this is again, stuff that you should put in a document. You say, look, you're hiring me. Here are my rules. This is how I work. And they're negotiable. I think it, I think the key to good business is being flexible. You know, you want to get to a place that's fair for you and that is fair for your client. That's the way it is, right? It's, uh, we do that now, even with drawingforce.com, same thing. Like a lot of students always ask like, oh, what are the hours you can be able to teach me? Like we're very flexible. We understand everyone's got a crazy schedule. So we try to work with your guys' schedule, right? Um, I worked on a game called Ultima X for a few years. It was a huge MMO with like hundreds of character designs and so on. And we, you know, we had to create a system. We're like, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate in short sketches. We'll have about 15 to 20 short sketches. And out of those, we're gonna take like the top five and tighten them up a little bit. And then maybe down the three, and then finally the one that was the one that got the final line clean up and went to color and so on, right? So this is kind of hierarchical process that we kept just going through, right? And that worked, you know? So you wanna, converse with your client to figure out what the system is going to be for the work that you're going to deliver, right? And the clearer you can make all that up front, the better, there's less confusion later. And to Swanley's third point here, um, one mistake that lots of artists make is they allow the client to go crazy with revisions and it costs you time to do that. You want to make sure you get paid. You can maybe tell the client, you know, you get two revisions for free. Once you hit the third one, I'm going to charge X amount more. And you can decide however it is. You could say there's no revisions and I'm going to charge you for whatever revision that there is. To me, it doesn't seem fair, of course, right? If I was a client, I want at least one shot to have my feedback in there, right? And I like what Swanley said too, by the way, which is a really interesting point. I think the best way also to do business, it doesn't matter if you're an employee again or you're freelance, is have empathy, you know, be aware of the other side. Uh, you know, they're taking risk in you, you're taking risk in working with them, right? Make sure that I always try to think of both sides of the fence, you know, so I understand where the other person's coming from. Having empathy, I think, uh, sets a better business uh, meeting, you know. Um, I think that's it. So that's everything we have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this um, subject, a little off topic from just uh, how to draw, right? And all the different skills to drawing with force. Um, I want you guys to be able to go out there and be successful as artists, you know, and hopefully if you want to make a living, you know, make an income during doing so. So, uh, yeah, it was a pleasure having all you guys. Um, I want to say, you know, if you like what you saw today, please subscribe to, um, our YouTube channel. Um, and if you don't are not aware of this, you know, go check out drawingforce.com. That is where Swanley Matunje and I are seven days a week as workaholics, <laughs> teaching you guys um, how to draw with force, right? Which is the only place on the whole planet Earth, quite frankly, that you can come to learn exactly what we teach, okay? We're the only ones out there. So stop on by the website and we will hopefully see you guys soon. If not at the site, we'll see you next Friday here um, on the YouTube channel. Take care. Thanks, guys. Yes, thank you, guys.